This week on the Green Left News podcast, momentum continues to grow in the movement to free Palestine. Tiwi traditional owners block Santos and US car manufacturing workers win a tentative deal after six weeks on strike. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis, and today I'm joined by Green Left contributor Anissa. Welcome. Hi, Isaac. Thanks for having me. Now, the biggest story of the week continues to be the huge growing movement resisting Israel's genocidal war on Gaza, and there's a ton to report on. But before we get to that, let's discuss some of the other stories that have happened in Australian politics this week. And first up, in another important victory for Tiwi traditional owners, gas giant Santos was ordered by the federal court on November 2 to stop work on its Barossa pipeline. The court decided it would hear the case of Jikilaruwu man Simon Munkara, that the pipeline should be halted because it could breach environmental regulations. The pipeline also threatens ancestral burial grounds and songlines, and Munkara said Santos had not undertaken a proper assessment of these significant risks to cultural heritage. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese recently visited the United States for a four-day trip to Washington, which the White House boasted was a celebration of the US-Australia alliance. But Albanese did not get everything he wanted out of the trip, including bills to breathe life into the AUKUS alliance. Some Republicans oppose the U.S. helping build the $368 billion nuclear-powered submarines. But given that this was Albanese's second trip to Washington since he was elected, he is determined to tie Australia to the U.S.'s imperial aims in the Asia-Pacific. Other measures announced included cooperation on new technology, artificial intelligence and space. Minister for Resources and Northern Australia, Madeleine King, also announced a new Australia-US task force on critical minerals, with Labor pledging $2 billion to subsidise mining companies. Albanese then travelled to China where he met with President Xi Jinping and discussed the trade relationship between the two countries. A packed-out meeting at Leichhardt Town Hall in Gaddy or Sydney's Inner West showed strong support for changes to New South Wales Local Government Act to allow residents to vote to de-amalgamate local councils that were forcibly merged by the former coalition state government. About 100 people attended the October 31 meeting, which was organised by residents for de-amalgamation. Green's MLC, Dr Amanda Cohen, who addressed the meeting, is preparing to move the amendments which have been workshopped across communities fighting to make their councils local. New South Wales Labor was elected promising to make these legislative changes, but so far has not acted on its promises. Communities across the state, including Bombala, Central Coast, Canterbury Bankstown, Cootamundra, Gundagai, Pitwater and Hilltops are all fighting for a say over their local councils. This year, the annual Reclaim the Night rally in Geelong was followed the next day by a conference discussing feminist campaigns organised by the Geelong Women's Unionist Network. The rally was emceed by Geelong Women's Unionist Network co-convener Adele Walsh and conference speakers included Community and Public Sector Union National Secretary Karen Batt, Arente Woman writer and unionist Celeste Little, Will Strack, Victorian Trades Hall Assistant Secretary and Chris Cousins, Geelong MP. The conference dinner was addressed by activists from Refugee Women for Visa Equality. Tamil women spoke about their long track from Nam, Melbourne, to Ngunnawal, Canberra, to raise awareness about the need for themselves and 10,000 refugees to have permanent visas. Climate activists and civil rights defenders have called on the ABC not to accede to Western Australian police demands to hand over footage of climate protesters. The demands were called alarming overreach by more than 40 civil society organisations, including Amnesty International, the Human Rights Law Centre and the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, or MEAA. The ABC's Four Corners filmed a handful of protesters outside Woodside boss Meg O'Neill's house in August, as part of an episode on the criminalising of protests. Woodside is involved in destroying both the climate and sacred First Nations sites through its Burrup Hub gas project and others. The MEAA petitioned the ABC not to hand over its footage, saying the request was a direct threat to press freedom. Disrupt Burrup Hub media advisor Jesse Noakes questioned who would ever trust the ABC again. ABC journalists protested outside offices in various cities calling on their employer not to hand over the footage. 
Trust in the ABC is also eroding over its coverage of the genocide in Gaza, with Ali Kazak, a former Palestinian ambassador in Australia, writing a stinging open letter to the ABC, criticising the pro-Israel bias in its coverage. The October 31st letter called on ABC Managing Director David Anderson to stop dealing with the war from an Israeli perspective, adopting all its claims, propaganda and deceptions without examining their credibility. He said it is giving the Israeli military and government a free platform to spread their lies and deception without interruption or challenge. He pointed out that Palestinian interviewees are always asked if they condemn Hamas, but Israeli interviewees are never asked if they condemn their government's occupation, racial discrimination or ethnic cleansing. Yeah, and like most of the mainstream media, the ABC is failing in its duty to present the truth of what's happening in Gaza. Most are not even reporting on the huge rallies that have been taking place across the country here in Australia, which have been some of the largest anti-war protests since the protests against the Iraq war. Shockingly, the ABC is even downplaying the death of one of its own journalists who was killed by an Israeli airstrike while working for the ABC on October 22nd. Roshji Saraj is one of many journalists who have been killed by Israel for reporting on the war in Gaza, and the ABC only acknowledged him on air with a single sentence without elaborating on how he died or displaying his photo. Journalists and others rallied outside the ABC offices in Nam on October 31st, holding a silent vigil for Saraj and all journalists who have been killed. Criticism of the ABC did not end there. The ABC was also called out on X, or Twitter, for taking down its story about a sit-in protest at Deputy Prime Minister Richard Marle's office in Geelong. The inspiring protest was organised by the Loud Jew Collective, with about 50 anti-Zionist demonstrators occupying Marle's office and demanding Labour withdraw its support for Israel's occupation of Palestine. Some locked themselves to a ladder with a bike lock, while others held banners that said, Not in our name and stop the genocide. And in Garamilla or Darwin, protesters gathered outside the $5,000 per head dinner that was attended by Albanese and others, and people held signs demanding that the Prime Minister condemn Israel's brutal attacks against Palestinians and calling for an immediate ceasefire. But Albanese avoided the protesters and slipped into a side door to the private function. And while the activists were peaceful, two plain-clothed officers effectively acted as security guards, grabbing and dragging activists away. Afterwards, Territorians for Palestine posted a statement which said, at an exclusive $5,000 a head dinner, Albanese thought he could have a quiet night with his business executive mates, but people standing in solidarity with Palestine gathered inside and outside the venue to call for a ceasefire and an end to the genocide. Activists rallied outside Coburg Town Hall on November 8th to support Marybeck Councillor's motion to fly the Palestinian flag over council buildings to show the strong community support for the Palestinian cause. The motion was put by Socialist Alliance Councillor Sue Bolton and Independent Councillors Monica Hart and James Conlon. It called for an immediate ceasefire, unlimited humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza, the lifting of the siege of Gaza and for the council to seize all contracts connected to the Israeli military. And in a win for the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, RMIT University has ended its partnership with Elbit Systems, which is Israel's largest weapons manufacturer. It's a sign that universities are feeling the heat of the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Elbit Systems develops, tests and provide weapons and drones to the Israeli Defence Force. And Hilmi Dabag from BDS Australia said this is a significant victory for the BDS movement in Australia. He said Australian universities have been put on notice that they will be targeted if they partner with any Israeli company or institution complicit in human rights abuses and attacks on Palestinians. The RMIT announcement came after an October 19 protest by Students for Palestine on the university campus and years of campaigning by Palestinian activists. On November 7th, activists rallied outside the Sydney Convention Centre in Darling Harbour to protest the 2023 Indo-Pacific Naval Expo, where representatives of the world's major arms manufacturers, naval and government delegations from around the world were gathering for three days. Demonstrators named the major arms companies, condemning them for profiting from genocide in Gaza, West Papua and elsewhere. Yeah, and as well as those uh, actions and others, including activists blockading the entrance to the Melbourne Cup and staging a sit-in at Melbourne Central, uh, the weekly Palestine rallies in most major cities have continued, with some estimates putting the recent rally in in Nam on November 5 at 100,000 people. Uh, Tens of thousands have gathered in Gaddi the day before and thousands marched in every major city that weekend. And the momentum continues to build as people turn out week in, week out for these protests. 
And if you're listening to this and haven't made it to one of the rallies in your city, we really urge you to join the next ones. They're pretty much happening every weekend and it's the easiest way to show your solidarity with Palestinians and connect with others who are campaigning to end our government support for Israel. And you can be a part of the huge and powerful movement against genocide by finding the details of upcoming rallies at the Green Left Activist Calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events. However, rallies are not the only way to stop our government's support for Israel. Another way is by campaigning for union support for Palestine. On November 3rd, important Unionists for Palestine meetings took place in Nam and Gadi, where union members gathered in response to a call to action from Palestinian trade unions. The meeting discussed how unions can contribute to stopping Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza. Both meetings were packed and attended by hundreds of unionists. More than 2,000 unionists have signed on a call to end Israel's brutal war, its occupation and practices of apartheid and ethnic cleansing. The Maritime Union of Australia, Sydney Branch and the CFMEU Construction Division have signed on. Members of nurses, teachers and other unions were present showing broad support for the Palestinian cause. And as we've mentioned, there's so much going on in the movement for Palestine, and we highly encourage everyone to get involved. You can check out our coverage of the rallies at greenleft.org.au. And if you have photos or videos of rallies that you'd like Green Left to share, you can submit them to photos at greenleft.org.au. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. The heroic six-week strike of car workers who work for the big three car makers in the US has been suspended after the United Auto Workers Union reached tentative agreements with the companies. If UAW members vote up the agreements with Ford, General Motors and Stellantis over the next few weeks, the strike will be over. If the workers vote them down, the strike will continue. The UAW scored its first victory when it settled with Ford on October 25, and this pressured the other companies into agreeing to similar terms. The agreements include immediate pay rises of 11%, up to 25% over the four and a half year length of the agreement. While the union did not win all of its demands, it won significant gains without any concessions or trade-offs. The UAW victory gives the rank and file everywhere more hope and higher expectations to win good contracts and organize their own unions and shows the power of collective organizing. Also in the US, pro-Palestine protests and rallies have spread across the country in opposition to the escalation of the US-backed Israeli war against the Palestinian people. As the death toll in Gaza grows by the hundreds every day, US President Joe Biden's response has been, in his words, 100% support to Israel. The US was the only country on the United Nations Security Council to vote against a motion calling for a ceasefire. Biden also dismissed calls for a ceasefire to allow for humanitarian aid in, Telling journalists, we should have those hostages released and then we can talk. Palestinian blood is now on Biden's hands. The protests in the US are widespread and reminiscent of the Black Lives Matter movement against police violence in 2020, following the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. There has also been significant action at universities and colleges, where students are speaking out despite being threatened by authorities. One powerful rally was in Washington, D.C., where 500 members of Jewish Voice for Peace, led by 25 rabbis, occupied the Congress building where they read testimonials from Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah, and as well as Australia and the U.S., Canada has been one of the most steadfast supporters of the Israeli state's occupation, apartheid and genocide against Palestinians. And Justin Trudeau's government has expressed continuing support for Israel's latest uh, war on Gaza, refusing to call for a ceasefire, even as the Gazan Health Ministry reported that the death toll had passed 8,300 on October 30. Canada was one of the 45 countries that abstained from that vote on October 27. Um, the United Nations call for a humanitarian pause in Israel's bombardment of Gaza. But activists in Canada have been targeting the arms companies that profit from the genocide, including blockading facilities, Canada actually awards 315 export permits and exported 21.3 million Canadian dollars worth of military materials and technology to Israel in 2022. 
Witnessing the horror inflicted on Gaza by Israel has inspired many to take action around the world. Generations of activists in Egypt have been politicised by the Palestinian cause. The 1967 war between Israel and Egypt, Syria and Jordan led to student protests and a full-fledged social movement which resulted in the national revolt against President Anwar Sadat in 1977. However, in following decades, President Hosni Mubarak clamped down on all dissent in Egypt. Then in the 2000s, the breakout of the Second Palestinian Intifada revived street dissent in Egypt and along with protests against the Iraq war, and then the anti-Mubarak movement led to the January 2011 revolution. Throughout the late 2000s, the Egyptian government has used its control of the Rafah crossing, the only entry into Gaza not controlled by Israel, as a bargaining chip to control Palestinian leadership. Then, in 2013, it closed the crossing, promoting conspiracy theories against Hamas, before in 2014 joining Israel in its attempt to eradicate Hamas and enforce punitive measures on the entire population of Gaza. Now, huge protests are taking place in Egypt, with football fans, lawyers, actors and students all taking action. Amid economic crises and worsening living conditions, the pro-Palestine movement could once again be the catalyst that inspires change in Egypt. Yeah, it's been great to see so many countries around the world starting to cut ties with Israel, including Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Honduras, Bahrain, South Africa, Jordan, Chad and Turkey, who have all withdrawn their ambassadors. But as the world's eye is locked on the atrocities in Gaza, uh, one of those countries, Turkey, has actually used the opportunity to ramp up its attacks on Kobani, which is the site of legendary resistance against ISIS by Kurdish women. Turkey continues to bomb Kobani, targeting civilians to depopulate the area. And the current offensive against the region was launched after an attack against the uh, police headquarters in the Turkish capital of Ankara. And the Turkish government is claiming that the attackers received training in the Kurdish-held Syrian territory, but Kurdish authorities have denied any involvement. The Turkish attacks deliberately target civilian infrastructure and have damaged vital power and water stations serving the region affecting about 5 million people. The death of Bang Yong Won, a South Korean taxi driver and trade unionist, has drawn international attention to the harsh and super-exploitative working conditions suffered by the working class in a country that has an international image as a high-tech, relatively developed and wealthy nation. After a 227-day struggle, demanding a full monthly salary system and claiming underpayment in accordance with the laws, Bang, a member of the Korean Public Service and Transport Workers Union, or KPTU, set himself on fire on September 26. He died from extensive third-degree burns on October 6. Veteran Korean labour and peace activist Shin Jun-shik accompanied Lachlan Batchelor, the lead organiser from Union Aid Abroad AFIDA, and Carolyn Dunbar, who leads the women's team at Victoria Trades Hall Council on a visit to the shrine for Bang in Seoul on October 24. Shin told Green Left that the super-exploitation of Uber and taxi drivers is a form of modern serfdom that benefits taxi companies. Meanwhile, he said, human rights and the dignity of workers are not recognised. And the Socialist Party of Malaysia, or PSM, chairperson and former Member of Parliament, Dr Michael J. Kumar Devaraj, was arrested on October 24, along with a local farmer and two other PSM activists, for blocking a bulldozer attempting to destroy farmland in Kanthan, in the state of Perak. Shortly after he was released on bail, Devaraj told Green Left that he and the others had blocked the bulldozer to highlight the grave threat to nearly 2,000 small farmers growing vegetables and farming fish in the state. Eviction notices were issued to six farmers on October 13, giving them a week's notice to vacate, and this prompted the protest on October 24, when state authorities turned up with a bulldozer, and assaulted at least one protester. Devaraj said, these farmers are not criminals, but people who are feeding the community. He said it's very important for the food security and well-being of Malaysians for state governments to prioritise the preservation of land areas that produce fresh vegetables, fruit and fish for our people. Poland's October 15th elections ended the eight-year rule of the right-wing Law and Justice Party and the United Right Alliance centred on it. In its highest turnout in its history, 73.38% voted, particularly due to the mobilisation of young people and women. The background to the election is the social movements that have swept Poland in recent years, including mass protests against limiting abortion. The new government, formed by the Centre Civic Coalition, 
Poland 2050 and the new left will have to balance varying interests. Its initial announcements, including improving relations with the EU, providing funding for the National Reconstruction Plan, wage rises for public servants, teachers and health workers, and halting construction of the central transport port, which has been opposed by local communities. You can read more about all of the stories that we've talked about so far today, plus videos, detailed analysis and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Plus, you can find details of upcoming activist events at the Green Left calendar. Head to greenleft.org.au forward slash events for all the upcoming protests, rallies, forums, performance nights and more. And send in your events to be added to the calendar using the add event menu. On November 17, there'll be huge national school strikes for climate across the country. And you can find the info about your nearest rally at the link in the description or at schoolstrikeforclimate.org.au. That's using the number four. Let's support students fighting for a livable future and a better world. And then on November 24 to 27, the rising tide blockade of the world's largest coal port in Mullabimba or Newcastle is taking place with thousands set to blockade the port with kayaks and small boats. Come along and join the blockade. You don't necessarily have to get in the boat. There will also be people rallying from the beach. And this will be one of the most significant climate protests of the year, and we want it to be big. So click the link in the description or head to risingtide.org.au to find out more. If you have enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thanks to Little Archer Beats for the music and editing of this podcast. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.